Welcome, my friends, to the Bob and Brad podcast produced by Bob and Brad, the two most famous physical therapists on the internet. I am Bob and I exactly one half of the Bob and Brad team. Today is truly an honor to be joined once again by Dr. Hamad Abbasi, a uh, neurosurgeon, means he's smart. And uh, we've had him on before to talk about a, a minimally invasive uh, surgery he does for the lumbar spine. But this one is a minimally invasive uh, surgery for the sacroiliac joint. And you're going to find out that, you know, maybe your back pain is coming from your sacroiliac. We'll discuss all that today, uh, along with uh, what the procedure is, where it's at, how to get it. And uh, it'll be worth your time to watch and listen to the show. Welcome to the show, Dr. Bossi. Thank you so much again for uh, joining us. And uh, we're going to talk about a new topic today. We're going to jump right in. We're talking about uh, sacroiliac joint dysfunction. Why don't we start with uh, what, what are the, someone comes in, you suspect SI pain. Uh, what are the common tests that you're going to do? No, I, some of the things I learned and uh, I teach to many surgeons now is that include that in your differential diagnosis. Sure. Again, chameleon joint. If there anybody has you no, know, if the if the prevalence of that was like zero point one percent, right. we usually don't include that in our differential diagnosis. But the prevalence of twenty two percent, I think it absolutely need to get included in any kind of differential diagnosis of the lower back pain. Now, many times. There are other indications, like we talked about young female runners, wake them up in the night, and they, when they, they do activities, go stairs up and down, pain goes from side to side and so on. The history is very important. Yes. You have to start, many of the specialists, we become like so involved and so concentrating on the pictures, on the, yes. the, on the million dollar machine to give us the answer, whereas patient, has the most uh, advanced kind of sensory inside of them. They can give you all those information. Yeah, you, show, you should just talk to your patient and put your hand on the patient and examine them. Many of these patients, they put their finger on sacroiliac joint, but you just have to bother, let them stand up, let them turn around that you can look at the back and you ask them to put the finger on the back where the pain is. And often they put the finger on where the pain is, where is the sacroiliac joint? We are doctors. I'm not expecting everybody knows where the sacroiliac joint is, but I'm expecting everybody who has gone through the med school to understand where the sacroiliac joint is. Now, and we have even a name for that. We called it 14 test after, after Dr. 14, who figured out if, if, you, if they point to the location of the pain and within, an inch, always they point to the same place. There's a high likelihood that the sacroiliac joint is a problem. Another thing that I think is important is in some of them, not many of them, but at least half of this patient, the other side of the sacroiliac joint, Bob, is mm. our groin. They say, I have pain in the back. Sometimes they tell you. Sometimes if you ask them, they say, oh, yes, yes. Sometimes I do have pain in my groin because the other side of the sacroiliac joint is our groin. And then uh, the, the activities, you know, the, uh, like going stairs up and down. And the, all those help you that to make a yes. good picture of the, what the, uh, if the pain is in the sacroiliac joint, then if it hints in that direction, the next uh, action on the surgeon side is to provoke that joint. Bob, I know you're a physical therapist, right? Yes, and I, I wanted to ask you about the test that you developed. Yeah. Uh, I know you don't want to call it your name, the Abbasi uh, test. No. You should. Uh, but, um, <laughs> Medicine is uh, full of names. Uh, you know, I always tend to call, like, I have a device that makes something in the surgery much easier. And people ask me to call it, call it Abbasi. But that doesn't say a new person, a new surgeon, what that is. Right. Calling that facet 
decorticator. Every surgeon hears the name, they know what that what does. does. Right. Decorticate the surface of the facet joint in our spine. Every surgeon just he need to hear the name. So I'm more all more for uh, making teaching and learning easy rather than put my name on devices and tests. It, it almost seemed to me that, and maybe I'm wrong because I don't know what your test is for sure, but it seems like someone could almost do it on themselves. I mean, they could. They could. They could. I mean, first off, if they can't, do you want to describe it? But if they can't even do it, that's that's part of the test, right? Yeah. Itself. Generally, if it makes, yes, to a certain point, you can do it yourself, but um, it has to be that, you know, it's a passive, they have to be passive, somebody active. Sure. Because guess, guess what? Try to stick a needle in yourself, then you see how tense you become. Right. This is the same mechanism. It's one of those tests, it's better somebody else can do it for. It's a provocation test. What I learned over many years, do you know who is the best person to do that test? Physical therapist. Sure. They are the best people to do this test because they understand the joint. They are, they know uh, how to perform those tests. And the idea of the sacroiliac provocation test is anything that put pressure on it. Now, the fact is right. that this joint is in the middle of our body. There are lots of ligament attached to that. Sometimes you don't have, you cannot provoke enough force to provoke this joint. So for that reason, the, most of the time you use your pelvis and femur as a fulcrum, like, like a wrench, like a crowbar to magnify our force to provoke the joint. But the idea, I'm not going to go through the, the, the individual kind of test because right, you don't I can need send to. you, and I think for the popular, uh, for the populace, it's really- Yeah, that's, important. I would like you to describe yours so because- yeah, yeah. That would so, be helpful. <laughs> now, many times, uh, I think uh, many of these tests, they use your femur, your pelvis to provoke the test. Right. Now, and you remember we talked about that when many of these patients in the middle of the night, they wake up. Yes. Because they're, when they turn from side to side, it's something as well as trivia. And people don't know that, but every 15 to 20 minutes in your sleep, even when you are sleeping, you automatically turn from side to side. That is why you don't wake up in the morning having pressure sores, broken skin, because sure. you automatically do that. Now, these poor people, every time they do that, the pain wakes them up. And, so, and that's not surprising to me because uh, we find instability in the lumbar spine, the same thing. They, they'll, yeah. they'll wake up with pain. Yeah. Exactly. Now, the, the test that I developed puts, make it easier because to do the, those tremendous tests, you have to put the patient on a bed, you have to right. yank their, uh, their, their femur, take their pelvis and push them back and forth. Sometimes you need a place to start before you do those because if you do that with everybody, um, it's going to be tremendously uh, cumbersome. But if you want to do a quick test and then if it's positive, do the proper test, you just ask uh, uh, the person to, and I'm going to back a little to show sure. my own foot yep. here. You ask them to put one leg over the other one. Sometimes they cannot do that. That's already provoking their pain. Yes. And then if you, gently start pushing down on the knee down. Practically, you are distracting and extending the sacroiliac joint. And almost uh, everybody who has a sacroiliac joint at one or the other level described to you this action extremely painful. And uh, I'm, 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 ju I'm just going to call it sacroiliac combined test. All right. <laughs> Because that tells everybody that you're uh, practically putting denseling test, paper test, and distraction test together. All together. One easy test without putting the patient on a stretcher or a bed. 
But then if positive, then you still go and do those uh, provocation tests. And, and then you were, I'm sorry, I cut you off, but you were, you were about ready to talk about the next step to die dose is provoking the joint. So now once the history fits and the provocation test fit, you just have to make sure that that is where the pain is coming from. And the way I describe it to my patient, I tell them, when you go to the dentist, he numbs up, your gum on the right side and start drilling on the right side. Right. If he numbs up the right side and start on drilling on the left side, that numbing will have no proper action. It's useless. It only works if the pain is produced on the same side that if you numb it up, that pain goes away. And Guess what? And the sacroiliac joint is a very confined place. And there is a very specific protocol to that, which, by the way, has been nationally standardized. Like you have to do it in a certain way, from certain angle, in certain part of the joint, with certain amount of medication. So you don't want to numb everything. But if you do it properly, and patient will come back and tell you 75% of their symptom is gone away. And we sometimes we ask them to go and do things that are usually painful. And surprisingly, they can come and tell you, yes, 85% of my pain was gone, 90% of my pain was gone. But you have to tell them, I'm just numbing up the joint. So pain will return. As a matter of fact, some of, sometimes if patients don't understand what the diagnostic test is, right. see, this is not a therapeutic test. This is a diagnostic test. Sometimes they come and tell me that, doctor, it didn't help me at all. After three days, pain came back even worse. But then my question is, how was it in that three days before the pain come back? Oh, yeah, it was great for <laughs> three days. But this is the idea of a diagnostic test. And no. obviously, obviously, I think you talked about too that you got to make sure it's uh, in the uh, well in the joint and not the ligaments. Yeah. Uh, no, no. What we do is generally we want to be sure that they didn't get better just because of placebo effect, or they had a good day, or sure or some other other things. But we do. I do that test three times, meaning that I inject that uh, joint three times. If every time. I inject that joint, 75% of the pain goes away for a very short period of time, obviously. Then we are sure this is where the pain is generated. We call that pain generator. We, then we are sure that the sacroiliac joint is the pain generator. So and if that is the diagnosis is confirmed. Three separate occasions. Three separate occasions, wow. preferably two weeks apart, but at least until the waiting until the pain is back. Now, there is a caveat here. When I, this is not an easy joint to inject because bone is on bone, the space yeah. is very narrow. And because this joint has no function, nature allows lots of variations. Sometimes in the same patient, right and the left sacroiliac joint look different. For that reason, it's not an easy joint to inject, but um, we can do it if you are trained properly. You just have to go to somebody who has done it enough and knows how to do that because it is unlike other joints, it's harder than other joints to inject. But the caveat is once your needle is there, there's no reason not to put a little steroid there. About one fourth to one third of my patient after three injections, they come back and say, hey, doctor, I'm actually good. I don't want anything else. I say, great. I helped you with all the surgery. I send them out. And unfortunately, though, after two, three years, some of them still come back and the joint cause them problem. But now we know what the problem is. So this injection, even though it's diagnostic, by us adding a little bit of a steroid to that, we can as well combine it, make it making a therapeutic injection at the same time. Very good. The, be the beauty of that and what patient needs to know is that it, don't, it doesn't interfere with the diagnostic part. And the reason for that is local anesthetic, which worked for the diagnostic part, works right away. 
within two days is completely gone. As a matter of fact, when you go to your dentist, Bob, and they numb up your gum in your, how long do you feel the numbness? Well, usually that day. I mean, it, yeah, six uh, hours, six, eight hours. Right. Yeah, but because your gum is well perfused and it washes it out, sacroiliac so joint is not well perfused. So the local anesthetic realistic can stay one, two, three days, but nothing more than that. Do you need assistance as far, as far as uh, uh, video to guide you into the right spot, or do you yeah, just do we use we use either a CAT scan, CT, or a fluoroscope. Most of the time, we use sure. a fluoroscope, a live X-ray to tell, he, uh, practically guide us to be in the right place. And then once we put the local anesthetic and we put the steroid, the effect of the steroid is just the first day or two. Steroids start working four, five, six, or seven days after the injection. So they don't, it doesn't confuse you to gotcha. do both diagnostic yeah. and therapeutic injection. Makes sense. Okay, again, we'll have uh, his website down below in the comments, as well as to the links be for the previous uh, presentations on the lumbar spine. So thanks again, Dr. Bossi. Always my pleasure. Yep. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.